so glad to have you here. And uh, I know that uh, this will be an overview that um, many of you already know, but one of the reasons why we try to do this at the beginning of each of our Climate 101s is because we get people from so many different backgrounds and we just wanna make sure everybody's kind of on the same uh, place as we um, move ahead together. So I'm gonna grab a little highlighter here that'll help me out at some, uh, on some of the slides and we'll get going. So uh, just for clarification today, we're gonna be talking about climate. Most days people talk about weather. Uh, weather is what's happening uh, now or an event that you're talking about in, in the past, but um, it's essentially a, a single time state of the atmosphere and we talk about it in terms of um, whether it's cloudy or rainy or, or what have you. Um, so weather is very short term. Climate is, uh, uh, we call it essentially the statistical collection of weather conditions. Basically what this means is that um, we put weather in context. So um, if we have a rain event, how do we know that that rain event is uh, typical for that place and in that season? We compare it with what's happened at other times in that place. Um, and so climate gives us a context, it's long-term, um, and in some cases, uh, you may have heard the phrase, climate is what you expect and weather is what you get. So we're gonna start our first poll question. If you will read these examples and pick out the one that is not climate. So you're looking for the weather example. Okay, we have about uh, 12 responses so far. I'll wait another few seconds for you to um, respond. All right, so we'll end the poll and share the results. And excellent, good job. So uh, the highest wind gust on a particular day in a particular location. So this is a very specific uh, events that occurred. If we compared that to um, other wind gusts on other days um, um, to see if, if it was the highest that occurred ever in New Orleans, then we would be talking about uh, climate. Uh, but uh, in this case, uh, we're uh, just talking about weather. All right, let me close that. So this is our uh, climate system. So a lot of times when we talk about climate change, we hear about uh, the average global surface temperature and how that's changing over decades and centuries. Uh, that's only one element of our climate system. The climate system um, interacts in both the water, the land, the vegetation, and the atmosphere. It interacts with each other. So when something changes on a global scale, like our um, temperature, then that's gonna interact with all the other parts of the system. Uh, so if we look at some of the big components of our Earth system, this is a list of them. Uh, you probably have heard uh, these terms before with maybe the exception of albedo. So that's not a really common term, but albedo is simply um, the percentage of incoming sunlight that we get reflected off of, of our Earth. 
So let me walk you through each of these and why they're important. And uh, so this is regardless of climate change. Um, this is our climate system at, at its heart. Um, and it really starts with this um, average net radiation at the surface. So that sounds complicated, but basically what it is, is it's just a, a, a bank book of, uh, of balances. So you have incoming solar radiation, you add that at the surface, you have um, that reflection of solar radiation that I mentioned through the albedo. Uh, so we deduct that from the surface. We have incoming radiation from our atmosphere. So that's at a different wavelength than the sunlight. Uh, and that's added at the surface. And then we have uh, the removal of some of that, um, uh, what we call long wave radiation from the surface. Uh, and we deduct that from the equation. So we add two components and we subtract two components that gives us our net radiation. Uh, the solar energy that we have into our system um, is primarily at the wavelengths of sunlight or uh, well, of course it's at the wavelength of sunlight. It's at the wavelengths of uh, visible radiation and ultraviolet. Um, and then the radiation that we talk about that interacts within our atmosphere and, our, um, and leaves our earth is in the infrared. So we have different wavelengths of radiation as a result of their sources. So this average net radiation, which you can see, is that there is a surplus um, near the equator. So in the um, tropics and, um, and in the subtropics, we get a surplus of net radiation. And then in the mid-latitudes and the poles, we have a deficit of uh, net radiation. So this means more energy at um, near the equator, um, a deficit at the poles, and just like you try to do with your bank book, if you go in one account in deficit, you got to try to move some money to that account so that you can get it in balance. Our entire Earth uh, climate system is trying to do that. It's trying to move that excess energy from the um, tropics and subtropics toward the mid-latitudes and the poles. So that's our major um, driver. So part of that, as I mentioned, is related to this global albedo. So this is the reflectivity of the surface and it really relies on essentially what color that surface is. So areas that are very white or light in color, like you would see in um, these higher latitudes where we have lots of snow and ice are going to reflect most of the incoming solar radiation. Surfaces like these uh, desert regions in um, North Africa and in um, uh, uh, the Middle East are also very light in color. They're going to reflect most of the radiation. And one of the reasons why this is important is because in these snowy regions and icy regions of our earth, as that snow and ice melts, then the surface starts getting darker. And when it gets darker, it starts, starts absorbing more of that radiation and that warms the surface. And so one of the things that you'll see in global climate projections is that in the Arctic, um, it is warming at essentially twice the rate of um, most other places on Earth. And that's all a result of this change in that global albedo. Then we have the composition. So this is uh, what are the, all the different molecules that are in our um, Earth system. Most of it is nitrogen and oxygen, which is great for us to breathe. Um, but we have some of these uh, 
uh, molecules in the system that we kind of refer to sometimes as trace gases. Uh, they're in very small uh, quantities like water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, ozone. Uh, these are in small quantities, but they have a great effect on our um, atmosphere. And so you can think of this, I always um, uh, tell my students in my class, if I give you a glass of water, um, maybe you're really, really thirsty, I give you a glass of water and I'm just gonna drop a little bit of cyanide in that water, just, just a tad. There's not much in it, no worries, right? So they're li likely not gonna drink that. So even though there's a small amount, it can have a really, really large impact. And so um, these gases that are highlighted in this dark red color might be a little bit hard to see, but the carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, ozone and water vapor, those we refer to together as greenhouse gases. And I'll show you later why these greenhouse gases are important. So another major, major element of our system is the um, uh, global air temperatures. So these are air temperatures at the surface, either over land or ocean. And again, you see these patterns that result from this uh, higher net radiation near the equator um, and the lower net radiation at the poles. And depending on what season you're in, I'm showing July, um, one of the hemispheres warms up more and the other one cools down more, uh, but those patterns are going to influence our climate. Uh, then we have what we call the global pressure pattern. So you are used to high pressure and low pressure systems moving by your location. That's kind of the weather version of it, what you see on TV. But the climate version is if you average those patterns over time, um, the high and low pressure systems, you see these general patterns that occur. And they're caused by rising and sinking motion. That's a result, again, of that um, distribution of more energy at the equator and less energy at the poles. And so one of the things that we see with this is we have generally rising motion along the equator called the intertropical convergence zone. So that's a rainy region across our Earth. Um, then we have sinking motion, generally about 30 degrees north and 30 degrees south of the equator. Um, these end up being high pressure systems that predominantly sit over our ocean basins. So in the Northern Hemisphere, we have two main ocean basins. So we have two major high pressure systems. So the uh, Pacific or Hawaiian high, um, the Bermuda or Azores High. And we have three major ocean basins in the Southern Hemisphere. So we see these three major high pressure systems. And again, depending on what season it's in, uh, they will move either northward or southward. And then we also see um, um, in this example, these low pressure systems near the poles. So in the winter hemisphere, uh, which is the southern hemisphere in this example. In the winter hemisphere, we'll see these low pressure systems build. Um, so if this were uh, January, we would see the Aleutian low up here near Alaska and the Icelandic low build. Um, and the important thing about these uh, pressure systems is they forced the wind field. So winds don't exist without differences in pressure. So around high pressure systems, the surface winds will uh, circulate clockwise in the Northern Hemisphere and counterclockwise in the Southern Hemisphere. And so this is giving our surface winds motion that brings cool air from the North down toward the equator. Um, uh, in this uh, example of the high pressure system, warm air from the south toward the north. This is essentially our air conditioning system. This is what's distributing that, um, uh, that energy from the equator toward the poles. 
And also what those high pressure systems do is because of those wind fields at the surface, they're dragging the surface ocean with it. And that gives us our major ocean surface ocean currents across the planet. And so you'll see that these ocean currents are going in the same direction as those large scale high pressure systems, again, then dragging warm water to the north on the west side of um, those uh, high pressure systems and cold water to the south. Again, redistributing that energy, moving that around. That's the fundamental uh, way that our, uh, our climate system gets in balance. So any changes to those systems, those high pressure systems, those low pressure systems, any climatological change to that is gonna affect the, the, the entire planet, not just um, where, right where that um, high pressure system might be. So those systems, as I said, are moving bodies of air and we refer to these as air masses. These air masses kind of sit uh, for a while at a place and then they're moved by these wind systems, the high and low pressure systems. And so the characteristics that they gather are based on where they sit for a while. So those that sit over the oceans, we call maritime systems, they have lots of moisture in them. Those that sit for a while over the uh, land masses, we refer to as continental air masses, those are typically dry. The ones that are uh, near the equator, we refer to as tropical, so they gather a lot of heat. Um, and the ones near the poles, we refer to as polar or, um, or Arctic, and they're gonna be cold. So those, as we move those around, that gives us changes in our um, regional climates. Also affecting our regional climates is the topography, because anytime you get rising motion, you're gonna get clouds and the possibility of rain. And so if you, uh, for example, here are in the United States and we have generally westerly winds. And so every um, system that's coming off of the North Pacific Ocean, that's gonna be shoved up these Rocky Mountains. And when it's shoved up, it's gonna rain. Um, and then on the other side, that uh, air is moving downward. And so generally we get clear skies um, when, when we have that. And so that's where we see a lot of our patterns in our precipitation. So these precipitation patterns, just like everything else in the climate, is just a result of physics. So part of the physics is uh, having rising motion at the equator at that intertropical convergence zone. Part of those uh, equations of physics show us that rising motion here in the um, uh, very far western part of, the, uh, of North America is gonna give us precipitation. Uh, then we're gonna have drier air in the um, uh, Great Plains. And then as we get a circulation that moves maritime uh, moisture to the East Coast, we get another area here of uh, precipitation. So all of that is just a result of the physics of the system. So here's your next question. So of these components, which is the one that's kind of the driver that, that's causing changes in the other ones? Okay, so I think we have most people who have given their um, answers. So if we'll end the poll and show the results, then what we see is most people said it's the net radiation at the surface and that's correct. So that balance of incoming and outgoing energy, depending on what latitude that you're at, 
is going to be driving all of the other things, including the surface temperature. So surface temperature is really important, but it's also driven by that net radiation that occurs at the surface. Okay. So the key points for this area is that our system is pretty complex and interconnected. So one of the things that's very hard for climate scientists like myself is messaging about climate change because it's so complicated. It's not like a, you know, uh, I tripped over a curb and I fell on my face. That's pretty easy to um, uh, describe. Uh, so this is a complicated system and um, it's helpful to think about the big picture even when you're zooming in to your local decisions. So don't get so localized that you aren't thinking about how this um, is being driven by the big picture. So I encourage people to keep looking at some of those broader global climate model projections, even at the time that they might be diving deeply into the uh, regional climate projections at a point. And you don't have to do this yourself, okay? There are people uh, like Monica and Derek and Adrian and others who are here to help. And so please just get a hold of us and um, that, that's our job to help you out. Okay, so uh, another clarification on terminology, we refer to climate variability versus climate change. So climate variability um, is happening all the time. So especially if you live in the south central part of the country, you're very used to different kinds of weather systems moving in and changes that could be, you know, from one day to the next, you could have a 40 degree Fahrenheit change in temperature and you go from clear skies to a deluge of pouring rain. Uh, that's our climate variability. That's the system that's internal to the system. Um, and in uh, some places that's a fairly ra random occurrence. But in most places, uh, we have the random day-to-day -day variability superimposed onto some sort of cycles. And so this cycle, for example, if you think of this variable as temperature, this cycle could be El Nino versus La Nina. So we see global temperatures increase during El Nino years, decrease during La Nina years, and we get um, the El Nino, La Nina cycle every three to seven years. And so there's some sort of um, uh, cycles that are occurring there. Climate change is a trend. So, um, so we'll be focusing on that trend today, but remember that trend still has the cycles and it still has the random variability involved in it. So the random variability could result in this next winter being the coldest winter we've ever seen um, wherever you are. Uh, that's just part of the variability. This change we look at on a decadal to century or longer time scale. Um, so, have a little movie. Hopefully you will hear it. I think I clicked the right buttons. A common mistake when interpreting statistics is to look at them from too short a distance. This can make everything unclear and confusing. So forget the details and take a step back. You're looking at the dog when you should be concentrating on the owner. As you can see the dog is all over the place, leaping and bouncing, sometimes upwards, sometimes downwards. But where do you think it'll be in 10 seconds time? Around here, right? But at this moment, the dog is on its way downwards. So why do you think it'll find itself up there? It's because you've noticed the owner. The owner is the trend, and it's he who determines where they both will be in a while as a bit longer than a couple of dog bounds. He could change direction. There's a lot we don't know about this guy. But everything we do know indicates he's heading in that direction. The owner is the long-term trend. The dog is the variation around this trend. Or, the owner is the climate, the dog is the weather. All right, so both of those are going to be important to all of you. 
um, but just good to keep that in mind. Also, um, today and tomorrow, we're going to be focused on um, climate change as, uh, as it results from human causes. There is also climate change that's uh, natural. Uh, uh, for example, changes in our orbital mechanics uh, result in the major glacial uh, periods that we've seen um, over hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, if we get hit by a comet, which I shouldn't talk about because 2020 has already been a year of every disaster possible, but I'm going to say Bruce Willis will go save us if we get hit by a comet this year. Um, so there are things that are natural causes, and we see that in our climatic history. Those of you who said you mentioned you were geologists, you know this. Um, but this is really, really long term. Uh, we won't be talking about that um, in, in this section. And some people talk about, well, the sun's getting brighter, or we're in this, um, we're in some um, sunspot cycle, or what, what have you. So we also won't be talking about uh, changes in luminosity of the sun. Uh, uh, in the past few decades, this has actually decreased, not increased, but during that time we've seen our global average temperatures increase. Uh, so um, just a reminder, no single weather event is going to be um, uh, caused by climate change, but every single weather event has a climate change signal in it today. Um, and so we as climatologists are looking at uh, long-term trends. We're looking at changes in the frequency of different types of events. And specifically for many of you, we're looking at um, intense events, things that cause um, severe changes in ecosystems, for example. And yes, there are natural drivers, um, but our changes are occurring faster than that, and we can um, determine where they're coming from. And so uh, focusing on anthropogenic or human-caused climate change is much of uh, what we see in what's called the National Climate Assessment. Uh, this has, uh, uh, the most recent version has shown stronger evidence for continued rapid human-caused warming of the global atmosphere and ocean extremely likely that human influence is the dominant cause and then there's no convincing alternative explanation so believe me there are enough climate scientists out there that anybody who comes up with a uh, possible cause um, that's different from what we're going to be presenting here that has been, that has been tested and proven um, incorrect so there is no convincing alternative explanation. Don't count on Facebook to be your source of climate and weather information. Um, certainly look at the uh, wealth of reports through the National Climate Assessment, including most importantly for all of you, uh, this uh, report on impacts, risks, and adaptation. And if you're interested more broadly in um, the world, we have um, access to the um, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change reports. And again, it has a report that focuses on um, impacts and adaptation. And the reason why these reports are so important is because they're rigorously um, reviewed, they're transparent, uh, they're open for public comment, um, every public comment has to be answered by somebody on the, the science team, um, and that answer has to be publicly available for um, anybody to challenge. Those reports are not doing their own science. They're summarizing the science that has gone through the scientific peer review process over the, the decades. Um, it's basically, you know, trying to ensure that the time that you take is focused on the things that you need to do and not going to 10,000 scientific papers to try to figure out what's going on in our climate system. So I highly recommend um, 
these reports. Um, they're meant to be policy relevant, but not policy prescriptive. We don't tell you what to do. We summarize the science um, for you. So when these reports talk about climate change, then what do you think that they're talking about? All right, so we will um, close that poll. And yes, most of you got it. They're talking about the changes in the climate system. So these are all the different components of the system um, and the changes that have occurred since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. They do focus on the last several decades um, because that's where we've seen a lot of this acceleration of these changes uh, that occur. Um, and the reason why these are uh, important is um, itemized in this Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report. Um, there's five areas. I'm not going to go through them um, in detail just because of time here, but I do want to highlight a recent report called Global Warming of 1.5 Degrees Celsius. Um, this compares what will a warming of 1.5 degrees Celsius on average across the globe look like in comparison to the Paris target um, amount of 2 degrees Celsius. And it'll show you where the threats are changing and how high or low of a risk um, in some of those major um, areas. And so these are the reports. This will be included in the material that you can access, um, and those are all available online. All right, so real quickly, this is our, the crux of our human-caused um, uh, change in our climate system. Okay, the greenhouse effect, as I mentioned before, our solar radiation is primarily in the visible and um, ultraviolet wavelengths. Uh, the atmosphere is uh, mostly transparent to that. So that means that most of that solar radiation makes it to the surface. There's some reflection that gets rid of some of it, um, but it mostly just moves through our atmosphere. The infrared radiation that results from emission from our Earth, so our Earth emits in the infrared, that radiation is highly absorbed by these greenhouse gases that I named before. So that means that um, as the, that radiation tries to leave um, our, our planet, our atmospheric system, it's absorbed heavily in the atmosphere naturally by the natural occurring greenhouse gases. And then those greenhouse gases re-emit that energy, half of it upward, half of it downward. The half that comes downward warms our surface, okay? And without the greenhouse effect, our surface would be too cold for life as we know it to exist. So greenhouse effect, good. Natural greenhouse effect, good. The issue is when we add more greenhouse gases than has been natural. So the left side of this diagram is our natural greenhouse effect. Uh, the right-hand side is when we add more greenhouse gases, um, and then there's more absorption. There's more re-emission to the surface, and that's more energy going into the surface, raising our temperatures more, and then our temperatures act on the rest of our climate system um, it, it, with that redistribution of energy and all of the things we talked about earlier. And this is not a new concept. This does not uh, start with any political party in the United States or anywhere else in the world. This started from science over 150 years ago. Um, so it's been known for a long period of time. 
so our next question is, which of the following statements is true? Okay, we'll go ahead and end this poll now. I see that um, I probably didn't word this question very well. So we got uh, equal numbers on this. So it is true that the global average temperature can increase at the same time that we see um, the amount of solar radiation decreasing. That's actually what's happening now. We're seeing less incoming solar radiation but our temperatures are increasing. Um, the greenhouse gases are um, absorbing the heat. Uh, uh, I meant, I should have said at the surface so that that would be a wrong answer. They're absorbing the heat that does leave the surface, but they're absorbing that heat in the atmosphere, in the lower atmosphere itself. And then they're re-releasing that heat. So. Uh, Renee, mark, mark herself negative points for poorly worded question. Um, so those greenhouse gases are, um, are necessary, um, but we're adding too much uh, to the atmosphere. And where are we adding that from? So we're going to focus on carbon dioxide here. So we know we still have greenhouse gases that are increasing for methane and nitrous oxide and others. Um, but if you look at the percentage of, um, uh, of gases that are causing this, uh, carbon dioxide is the main one. And so where do we get carbon dioxide? Well, we have carbon dioxide in our natural systems. And there has always been. Um, in our past history, a natural balance between the carbon dioxide coming into the Earth's surface and that that's leaving the Earth's surface. So for example, forest fires will release carbon dioxide, that's natural. Um, the oceans absorb carbon dioxide, that's natural. But over a long, long period of time, this got to be a nice balance at the surface of incoming and outgoing. What changed was when we as humans started going below the surface, taking geological reserves of carbon, either in the form of coal or oil or natural gas, bringing it to the surface. If that's all we had done, not a problem. But then we burned it. And we burned it for good reasons, for energy. Our economy results from that burning. Um, so we're living in much better conditions than uh, we would have had we not done that. So that's great, except for it does have a long-term impact. And that's because unlike water vapor, which all of you who are working in water know that uh, our water cycle kind of works the water out of our atmosphere in a matter of a couple of weeks, um, carbon dioxide and some of these other greenhouse gases sit in the atmosphere for a long period of time, on the order of tens to hundreds um, of years, which means that any carbon dioxide that we uh, release now from the burning of fossil fuels is going to be in the atmosphere still when our grandchildren are in their jobs. Um, and so, so that means that this carbon dioxide um, uh, accumulates in the atmosphere. And our Earth system is trying its best to remove that. So again, the ocean tries to remove carbon dioxide. Um, our vegetation, so what, what's labeled here is the land sink. The vegetation is trying to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Um, and 
it just can't keep up. So the ocean and land together are removing about half of that excess carbon dioxide, but the rest of it now is accumulating in the atmosphere and that accumulation is getting greater and greater um, for each decade that we uh, go through. And even if we shut it off today, that excess carbon dioxide is going to be in the system. So that's why our center focuses on adaptation. So we know that we are going to have to live with climate change for the rest of our careers. Um, and so we see in the long term record that uh, skyrocketing increase of carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. All of these are long-lived gases. Methane has a shorter lifetime in the atmosphere um, than, uh, than the other two, but, um, uh, but we're seeing um, in all of our measurements, um, uh, on average globally, we're seeing this increase in the carbon dioxide. So this is the fingerprint of the burning of the fossil fuels. We still see our natural cycles as our Earth system kind of breathes in and our carbon dioxide uh, over the seasons. But um, most of the greenhouse gas uh, emissions that are occurring that are still staying in our atmosphere for a long period of time is energy related carbon dioxide. Again, uh, methane is uh, still a major part of it. So this is primarily through um, also fossil fuel use, but also through um, intense um, livestock uh, agriculture. Um, and what we're seeing through multiple methods that I didn't go into here, we are seeing that human fingerprint on our atmospheric composition. And again, as I mentioned at the very beginning, anything that happens to change that energy budget in our earth system is going to change everything the temperature the precipitation the wind patterns all of that because they're interconnected um, all right so hopefully that means that this question will be pretty straightforward for all of you. Okay, so we'll end that poll and show you the results. So yes, the um, because of the interconnection of that earth system that changing one component of it and the most important component that net radiation that we have in our system changing that will change all of our climate system and then our climate system will um, have uh, caused changes in other natural systems that we have um, here on our planet so we refer to those as indicators. So, uh, so the question is, okay, so our science tells us that these greenhouse gases are increasing. We're measuring that. Um, the science tells us that an increase in greenhouse gases will cause uh, more energy to be absorbed in our Earth system. And if more energy is absorbed in our Earth system, then that means our earth system should warm. And so what should we be able to measure if we have a warming world? So if we have a warming world, obviously we should measure increases in temperature because it's warming, um, but not just temperature in our air by the surface, but we should also, since that atmosphere is touching the top of the ocean, uh, the sea surface temperature should be increasing and the increase in ocean temperature should be greater at the surface than below. So we know that that energy is not coming from some deep volcanic activity. Um, it's coming from the warming of our atmosphere. 
and this whole host of other things should be happening. So are they? So we measure them through various techniques. We have all of our, you know, very sophisticated satellite and radar and um, even to the uh, back, backyard uh, rain gauge, all of that data coming in. Um, but we also have signals in our geologic um, history um, and, for example, in our ice cores where little bubbles of, of the atmosphere were trapped um, years and years ago so we can see what our atmosphere was like. Um, and so we use all of that to see are these things changing that we expect to see changing. And yes, indeed, we're seeing that overall the snow cover across um, the Northern Hemisphere is decreasing. Uh, the upper ocean heat content is increasing. We're losing significant amount of sea ice in the Arctic. And uh, we can measure the rise in um, uh, uh, sea level as a result of glaciers on land melting and adding that water in, into the big ocean buckets. Um, but also in those ocean buckets, uh, water expands when it's warm. So even without adding that extra water, we get sea level rise. And so uh, we can also then look at our changes in our temperature over time. So this is a record from the late 1800s, averaged over land, so at weather stations. Um, and this is, an this is the anomaly. So the, so the base period here was from 1880 to 1920. So the black line represents um, uh, that period of time, anything above that is warmer, that month was warmer than um, the base period. Anything below that, uh, the earth was cooler for that month. And what we see is that, um, again, we see monthly and uh, annual changes, so we still see all of our El Nino and La Nina cycles and our daily uh, weather and climate variability that occurs. But over my lifetime, which goes back to 1980, okay, maybe not so believable, but um, uh, over the lifetime of all of the uh, college students that I supervise, they have only seen a few months in their lifetime that has been um, below average temperature. So clearly, especially in the last few decades, we're seeing a significant increase in those um, surface temperatures. These are globally averaged surface temperatures. So what happens at you in your state for a given year is a little tiny blip in the data. Even the United States, the United States is 3% of the data, it covers 3% of the Earth's surface. Um, so even a, a very frigid or a very warm um, year in the US is a little blip in all of this global data. And we can look at this um, by decade, and you can actually see some of this natural cycle. So this uh, cycle here is a result of the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation, um, but superimposed on that natural cycle is this increase in our um, temperatures. Uh, now, even with this globally averaged increase, what you know is where you are, it depends on where you are, on what impacts you're going to get. And so the impacts are regional, which is what we're going to be talking about for the rest of this um, uh, 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 workshop. So those impacts are regional. We see um, temperatures in the far northern um, hemisphere 
are increasing faster than temperatures elsewhere. That's that Arctic amplification as a result of um, as a result of the uh, snow and ice melt. But even in the United States, we see a region of our United States that over the last hundred years had actually cooled some. And so it's no surprise that many people within our um, area don't think climate change is happening because we've actually seen some cooling. And this cooling is, um, uh, likely a result from the increase in forests um, over the last century in the southeast part of the United States. You add forest, you add transpiration of water. Transpiration is a cooling process. And so we have some localized land use that's affecting that. Um, again, uh, things are regional in terms of the uh, precipitation that we see and the changes. It's not only regional, but different precipitation changes will happen in different seasons. So we wanna keep that in mind. Um, we do see that the um, ice in the Arctic is, uh, is declining. So this is the extent of the ice as measured from satellite. So the record isn't as long as some of the records that we have, because we didn't have a satellite until the late 1970s over this region. But not only that, the, the thickness of that ice is decreasing and the age of the ice. The old ice is being melted, that old stable ice, and we're getting very young ice that's occurring. Uh, we see similar things happening with the ice on our land. So um, we um, there are several glaciers across our earth that are increasing in size because of additional precipitation that has occurred as a result of climate change. But most of the glaciers across our earth surface are decreasing in terms of extent and also thickness. We're seeing, um, in addition to these increases in um, carbon dioxide in our atmosphere, we're measuring those increases of absorbed carbon dioxide in our uh, surface, um, ocean surface, and uh, carbon dioxide that's um, um, uh, it dissolved in water makes that water more acidic. So we're seeing the pH of that water uh, decrease, which is affecting uh, the shells um, uh, of our sea life. Um, it's also affecting um, uh, rigid uh, uh, skeletons of, of coral, but not only is that affecting it, but the warming of the waters is actually affecting those corals too. Uh, when those waters get warm, the coral gets stretched, stressed, and when the coral is stressed, it releases the little algae that are with them, the colorful algae. Um, and it turns into essentially just that coral uh, skeleton structure, and that's usually kind of whitish or gray. And we're seeing these coral bleaching events occur, especially during El Nino events, where those ocean waters get even warmer. Um, so these bleaching events are occurring. We're seeing, again, sea level rise, but this is regional. So it depends on what the land is doing in Louisiana along uh, Texas coastline. We have uh, subsidence of the land um, as a result of a number of um, uh, human caused um, compaction. But, uh, and then, so that's superimposed on sea level rise. So, uh, the Louisiana Delta is kind of the poster child of uh, sea level rise in the United States. Whereas in Alaska, where we're removing weight of that uh, ice uh, from those glaciers on Alaska, the land is rising up because of uh, the geology that a whole bunch of you know. Um, it rises up in the asthenosphere as that land gets lighter. And so we're actually seeing some sea level falls. 
we also have changes. There'll be a lot of changes that will be discussed in the next two days, but here's kind of a lead in um, uh, to some of the changes that we're seeing in nature. This is an example from Kyoto, Japan, uh, where they uh, looked at the peak of the cherry blossom. And we can see in just the last few decades that that's getting earlier and earlier in, in the year. Um, so we're seeing what in the climate world we call rapid changes. Um, these are on a decade level. Uh, these are changes that are affecting the entire natural system. These are all consistent with a warming planet and they're not consistent with just long-term natural variations. So the last question that I leave you is looking for the false statement here. And one of the reasons I put this in is because on Twitter and Facebook and from your family and friends and all of that, you hear things like, but didn't you hear such and such a glacier is increasing, so there can't, it can't be climate change. Um, and such and such a thing is happening, so it can't be climate change. So we'll go ahead and end. Um, and the poll there. So uh, overall, we're seeing sea level rise occur across the world, but there are locations where there's sea level falls. And as I showed you, those sea level falls are actually consistent with climate change uh, because of the melting of that snow and ice. Um, so hopefully, I know I went a little long, but hopefully that gave you a good overview of, um, of our climate system. And as always, I encourage you to put any questions that you have in the chat box.